Welcome to Wales Tech Week 2021. Thank you to our partners. Enjoy the session. Well, it's a pleasure to welcome everybody to the session uh, today uh, on translational neuroscience. I've had the pleasure of, of um, observing both from the academic and the industrial side as, as a former CSA to the Welsh Government. Uh, and currently I'm a, I'm a director of the UK Dementia Research Institute at Cardiff University. Uh, it's a really exciting session that we have planned uh, today. The first speaker, uh, Vincent Dion, uh, joined the UK Dementia Research Institute about two years ago and has got a, already an enormously successful group and is going to share with us his, uh, his views on uh, gene therapy uh, applied to dementia. Over to you, Vincent. So I'm going to be very specific about gene editing, which is a subtype of gene therapies. I'm happy to uh, uh, to say that uh, it's an exciting field to be working in. Uh, and dementia specifically, dementia treatment is a major unmet medical need. And so there's about a million people right now living with dementia in the UK, and that's 7% uh, of people over 65. It's an astonishing one out of every two people over 85. And so there's also, in addition to this human cost, there's also an economic cost, which is about 26 billion annually, which is an enormous, and it's mostly covered by the government and families of, uh, of patients. Uh, crucially, for both of these to go down, we need an effective treatment that is currently not, um, is not available. And so one of the potential avenues is gene editing. And so this is really what uh, my group is focused on and what I'll be telling you about. Uh, so gene editing, put simply, is deleting, inserting, or replacing uh, genetic material. So that's DNA inside uh, someone's cells. So the crucial thing about it is that it leads to a permanent change. So we are talking about uh, cures when we're talking about gene editing, completely re removing the cause of the disease. So typically, a genetic disease, you'll have a mutation that will either cause a toxic product or a, so a toxic protein or uh, will be the absence of a, of a functional protein, at least. And so the idea with gene editing is that we would correct that and activate that mutation uh, or correct that mutation such that we remove the underlying cause of the disease. Um, gene editing sounds really <laughs> promising, but there are some challenges, specifically how we get or how we find the mutation in the DNA how do we correct that mutation? And in the end, how do we deliver uh, the treatment? And so uh, the first one, what I, we're, we're actually in a lucky position that now sequencing has given us, uh, in many cases, the, the underlying cause of the mutation. So when I say finding the mutation, I mean finding it inside the nucleus of a cell. So we have now about 3 billion base pairs per a cell in every one of our 1 trillion cells. And the mutation is found at one specific place in that DNA. So how do you find that? And once you found it, how do you uh, correct it? And that, uh, the answer to both of these questions is actually coming from uh, a technology called CRISPR-Cas9, which was originally from a bacterial immunity system where you have two components. You have a protein that can cut DNA, and then you have an RNA that can guide that protein to, the, to your mutation. Specifically, this, this RNA, you can change the sequence as you wish, to um, to bring it to any places. So what you would do is you would design your guide RNA to find a mutation that would bring in the Cas9 enzyme that would cut the DNA, and this cut then allows you to mutate again that mutation on top, inactivate it, or correct it. Um, so I have I want to mention that um, nobody uh, went out and tried to uh, find a new way of doing gene editing, right? So this is it works always the other way around where you have basic research, you have someone working in an obscure corner of a, academia uh, at uh, bacterial immunity, find something that we can co-opt and apply uh, to revolutionize uh, how we treat genetic disorders. So my point here is fund basic research. It's very useful for translational research. 
Uh, how we get this inside the cell in the first place, uh, right now one of the most promising avenues is uh, adeno-associated viruses. So this is a virus uh, that doesn't cause any pathologies. It, um, um, about 80 to 85% of us are infected by, by these viruses. And so what you do is you strip out what's inside uh, all the virus parts, and then you put in uh, your Cas9 enzyme, your guide RNA, and then you can deliver it to the cell types you want. So right now, it, it's uh, the technology has been shown to work in uh, in dogs, for instance, for uh, Duchenne muscular dystrophy, and in the case of people, it's now in clinical trials for the last year now. Uh, for instance, the first one was to try to treat a congenital blindness. And so uh, this is incredibly exciting right now to be in this field because it, there's about to be an explosion of clinical trials looking at gene editing uh, ways of, uh, of treatments. Uh, and so, but there's still risks, obstacles and unknowns to overcome. So specifically there's the efficiency, right? So uh, we're looking at how do we get the maximum number of cells uh, with, that are corrected um, there's the, the delivery, which is, um, you know, obviously the more virus you deliver, uh, the more cells are infected and the more cells can then be corrected. But at the same time, as you increase the amount of virus, you also increase potential for uh, side effects like an immune, a violent immune response. And so you have to, there, there are ways to, um, to dose this properly. And so those two first uh, problems are tractable. The one that really keeps me up at night is the safety one. And so that's for three reasons. The first one is the unwanted mutations that occur at places that are not supposed to be occurring. So, you know, there are places in the genomes that will look more or less the same uh, and they can be cut. So it cannot be that we uh, treat a dementia to then uh, provoke another disease uh, on, uh, at the same time. The second is the fact that it's, it's a permanent change. So what that means is that if you have a treatment, you can't just, if someone has a, a, an adverse effect, you can't just uh, reverse it by stopping the treatment. So this is permanent. So the safety standards will have to be uh, very high. And finally, even though here I'm, I'm specifically interested in, in brain disorders, um, there's a need for not editing uh, the germline that is passed down to the next generation. And so there's safeguards that need to be put in place to make sure that the viruses don't end up um, there. And so, um, what I want to spend the last uh, couple of minutes uh, doing is uh, tell you about uh, what we do in, in my lab. Um, as you know, dementia is not one disease. It's actually multiple different diseases, Alzheimer's being the most common one. But you have some more, uh, some rarer diseases um, that uh, are very useful to study because they can tell us how to treat the more common ones. Um, and so this is the case for uh, what we're interested in, which is expanded repeat disorders. And so at 15 different sites in the genome, uh, you have triplets uh, that, so three base pairs, so in this case, CAG, uh, that repeats itself in unaffected individuals is gonna be, um, there's gonna be just a few of these repeats, but in affected individuals, you end up with uh, thousands of repeats um, at the same locus. And so, um, this is, uh, these expansions are, are very deleterious and the goal then is to shrink down these expanded repeats down to a normal size. And so these are diseases that you know about. So Huntington's disease, for instance, is a prime example. Uh, the, most of them are uh, characterized by a loss of neurons and uh, a loss, a decline in cognition, so aka uh, dementias. And um, what we're doing right now is we uh, try to solve the the, some of the problems that, that, we, that there is with gene editing, for example, with the safety aspects. So we're using a variant of Cas9 instead of doing inducing double-strand breaks, which are very mutagenic, that can lead to off-target mutations. We're looking at specifically NICs in the DNA, which is much milder, much less mutagenic. So that uh, brings down the the, of the possibilities for off targets. It's very, 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 very efficient. It really shrinks the repeat down to a, a non-pathologic site, uh, site within a couple of weeks in, in culture. So right now we're in, um, we're in animal models to try to see whether we can bring this to the clinic in the coming years. And with that, I'm happy to uh, take any questions that you might have. 
Thank you. Well, thank you, Vincent. I mean, this is an amazing area and I think a lot of future medicine will be based around uh, the, this sort of research. Uh, we're going to keep questions to the end, to the panel discussion right at the end. Can I um, uh, uh, enthuse people to, to put some questions in the, in the comment section and we'll come back to them uh, at the end uh, in the panel discussion. So it's my pleasure to uh, introduce the next speaker, which is uh, Robert Jones, who's the um, uh, Managing Director of Renishaw, and he's going to talk about Renishaw Advanced Tools and Surgical Robotic Systems for Treating Parkinson's Disease and Epilepsy. Over to you, Rupert. Um, okay. Um, so thank you very, very, very much for the invitation to uh, to speak this afternoon uh, at at this event and for the opportunity to tell you a little bit about Renshaw and how we are applying our technology to address some of the challenges faced in diagnosing and treating some of the most serious neurological disorders and diseases in our lives. Uh, my name is Rupert Jones and I head up the medical businesses of Renishaw PLC. Uh, Renishaw is a company that's probably unfamiliar to many of you and yet it is a, a FTSE 100 world leading metrology and precision engineering company. Metrology, for those who've not come across the term before, is the science of measurement and its application. Metrology is not just about the routine making of measurements, it's about the infrastructure that ensures that we have confidence in the accuracy, precision, and repeatability of the measurement. And that is the scientific bedrock upon which our neurological business, Renishaw Neurosolutions, has been built upon over the past 16 years. Uh, our products are sold and our core technology applied in a wide array of industries where precision, and positional control is necessary. Of, of course, neurosurgery is one such field, which is why it, it has not been a huge technology leap to enter that market, especially when considering that the dimensional precision required for surgical procedures is relatively crude when compared with what is routinely required when machining parts for the aut automotive or aerospace industry, for example. Renshaw is, is a global company and we export over 90% of our UK manufactured products. We have a physical presence across the globe with offices in 37 countries. We have approximately 4,500 employees, most of which uh, are in the UK. And we recruit mainly within the catchment of our main manufacturing facilities in South Wales and South Gloucestershire. Last year, we invested 16% of group revenue in, in research and development. And that level of investment allows us to not only keep abreast of technology advancements, but to drive a lot of the innovation that is fundamental to our business success. Our diverse customer base has allowed us to continue to invest during periods of economic uncertainty. And, and this year we will recruit 70 graduates and 50 apprentices in the UK. Within that global footprint, we have five main sites that support the neuro and healthcare businesses. The neuro business uh, headquarters is in South Gloucestershire. Uh, we have customer training and support facilities in South Wales, France and Chicago. Uh, our neurosurgical robot is manufactured in Lyon in France and our medical devices are manufactured in Dublin. So looking more closely at the neuro business and the actual products uh, that we manufacture, our products have been most widely used in clinical trials for Parkinson's disease, for treating the symptoms of Parkinson's disease, uh, for helping identify and correct regions of the brain that generate epileptic episodes and for the treatment of brain tumours. 
Although Parkinson's disease is the fastest growing neurological disease, epilepsy is where we currently have the greatest impact with all of the children's epilepsy surgery ser service centres, CES centres, in the UK having access to our systems. Our neuro business has two focus areas. The neurosurgery business very much focuses on what can be achieved today using the tools already available to clinicians to address the needs of Parkinson's and epilepsy patients. The drug delivery business is targeted towards the future as it supports and enables research into the development and subsequent delivery of therapies to the brain. So let's take a closer look at our neurosurgery business. Our two core products within the neurosurgery business are our stereotactic robot and our surgical planning software. And together they address the twin needs of speed and accuracy. When used with a range of ancillary medical devices, the platform provides the surgical team with a high degree of confidence in terms of procedural accuracy and ultimately predictable patient outcomes. Procedural confidence and outcome predictability are key elements of any surgical intervention. Our software allows for full procedure planning ahead of surgery. And this same software then positions the robot so that the surgeon can deliver their chosen devices swiftly and with the confidence that they're doing so safely. The main application we support for Parkinson's patients is the delivery is the delivery of DBS, deep brain stimulation leads for controlling the symptoms of Parkinson's. Our patented delivery mechanism not only ensures positional accuracy, it allows for the replacement of broken or damaged DBS leads without the need for further uh, significant surgery. For epilepsy, our platform is used to position SEG leads for the identification of specific loci within the brain that are responsible for generating epileptic episodes. The same platform can then be used to remove those areas with pinpoint accuracy in a minimally invasive way. The second focus area of the business, as mentioned earlier, is drug delivery. This part of the business focuses on the work done mainly by pharma and, and within academia as they research and seek to develop the therapies of tomorrow. We have developed a system that enables the highly targeted delivery of a range of therapies directly to structures within the brain, bypassing the blood-brain barrier, thus avoiding the inefficiencies associated with systemic delivery along with the often unpleasant and toxic side effects of systemic delivery. Our system involves the placement of narrow catheters within the brain, positioned with high accuracy to ensure the chosen therapy is delivered to exactly where it is intended and in a volume and concentration sufficient to ensure it is as effective as possible. The system can be used for single shot delivery, uh, for example, to administer a gene therapy or repeated delivery of a therapy without the need for additional surgical intervention. For example, when administering a chemotherapeutic um, for the treatment of, of a brain tumor, for example. On screen, you see there a representation of our four catheter system, which allows repeated infusion of therapies through a skull mounted transcutaneous port. The catheters are tunneled under the skin to the point at which they enter the brain through the skull to deliver the therapy at the target location. The system can of course be used to target any region within the brain 
and to treat all conditions for which there is a candidate therapy. We are currently involved in a number of research programs helping develop the therapies of tomorrow. Thank you very much, uh, and I look forward to whatever questions you may have for me at the end of this series of brief presentations. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, as, as Rupert said, we, we'll have questions. I certainly have, have a few. Uh, my next um, a pleasure to uh, introduce Robin Davis, who is the Chief Business Officer for Magstem. Magstem Technology uh, um, is going to be the focus of his uh, talk, uh, focusing on treating depression uh, in the wake of COVID-19. Over to you, Robin. I think we need to unmute Robin, <laughs> please. Thank okay, you. Thank, thank you very much. Just waiting for my slides to come up. Um, so. Ooh. Little glitch there. We'll try again. There you go. There we are. Ooh. Oh, one second. Can you see that now? Mm. There we are. That looks like it. You just need to put it on your. Uh... Just on full screen. In the okay. There. Thank you very much. Um, so I'm Robin Davis, Chief Business Officer of Magstim. Um, yeah. yeah, Magstim. We're a Welsh based, obviously, um, based in Whitland, down in West Wales, uh, medical device uh, manufacturer, leading supplier of transcranial magnetic stimulation systems. That is TMS for short. Uh, we manufacture all our components uh, and products here in uh, Wales and export, like Renishaw, to 90% of all our turnover is exported equally worldwide from the US uh, right through to Australasia and the Asia Pacific region. Um, Magstim is now part of the Welcony Group, um, which we've expanded um, by a um, expansion and acquisition in the USA. We have set up Magstim Inc. based in Minneapolis and incorporated um, EGI high density EEG systems, which we acquired from Philips um, Neuromedical last year. We have acquired uh, Technomed who manufacture accessories um, for our systems. Um, they're based in the Netherlands and also we have Technomed Asia. TMS, well, what is it? Sounds uh, like weird science, but it isn't. Uh, so um, TMS um, sprung up from Sheffield University uh, way back in the late 80s. So uh, we have 30 years experience on development TMS products. Um, we were the first co company to commercialize uh, the technology um, based on the research of Tony Barker, Reza Jalinas, and Mike Polson and Ian Priestin. 80% of the world's TMS research studies, that's about 14, 15,000 uh, clinical papers now, cite Magstim as uh, the pioneering products. So what is a Magstim or transcranial magnetic stimulation is a form of non-invasive brain stimulation. Uh, we have 30 years, as mentioned, of application in neuroscientific and clinical research around the world. Um, basically what TMS does it is used to modulate brain activity, or in short, neuromodulation. In the late uh, 90s, um, early 2000s, it was found that TMS could be used um, in the treatment of drug-resistant major depressive disorder, or MDD, one of the most prevalent illnesses worldwide. Uh, mentioned, uh, Julie mentioned at the intro, you know, COVID-19 has exacerbated exacerbated mental health illnesses and issues, especially major depressive disorder significantly and worldwide. So what is TMS? Well, TMS basically uses short pulses of magnetic energy to stimulate nerve cells in the brains. These magnetic pulses are delivered to the left dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, so the left DLPFC, 
This area is the brain that researchers believe is responsible for emotional judgment and mood re regulation. These rapid magnetic pulses created by the TMS system pass through the skull non-invasively and painlessly and induce an electrical current in the brain directly under the treatment coil. Those induced electrical currents causes neurons to depolarize and stimulate surrounding brain cells. So the system basically, and our most current system in the clinical world is called the Maxim Horizon Performance, and that is aided and abetted by a clinical new navigation system. So the magnetic stimulator, which you'll see in the main picture, has two main power supplies, which generate huge amounts of energy, equivalent to what an MRI produces this day and age, around two to three Teslas. That energy is passed through a stimulating coil placed on the head, and that then fires magnetic pulses and induces electrical current in the brain, um, depolarizing neurons and setting up um, activity pathways. The stim guide system is an accurate means which we've developed of making sure that that treatment coil is in the correct place all the time during the treatment regime. A, bit, a few facts on um, antidepressant medication and where TMS actually fits in. If you look at the worldwide spend on antidepressants, it's around $15 billion a year. In fact, if you look at the league table of prescribed medications, antidepressants are, are number three. It's a huge spend. But research has shown that only 39% of patients respond effectively and long-term to antidepressants. Basically, um, if someone presents to the GP or the psychiatrist with um, depression or major depressive disorder, they'll be prescribed an initial um, antidepressant. That will work, um, but after a significant period of time, there can be a high element of resistance um, and refraction from that drug. And therefore, a psychiatrist would prescribe an another antidepressant therapy on top of the existing one. So the patient would end up on a cocktail of antidepressants. The side effects of that usually are obesity, mood disorders, uh, sexual dysfunction, uh, as to name a few. Of the 60 plus percent of drug refractant patients, around 60% respond very positively to RTMS. And of that 60% response, about 60 to 80% of those will go into remission, which is quite a staggering fact. So there is a huge opportunity for TMS um, as an, a treatment for depression. Transcranial magnetic stimulation therapy was initially cleared by the US Food and Drugs Administration in 2009 as a treatment for adults with major depression who have failed to respond to at least one antidepressant medication trial. Um, in 2009, when this FDA clearance was given in the USA, adoption was rather slow because it was not um, reimbursed by the uh, major um, insurance suppliers in uh, the USA. That has all changed now. 100% of um, insurance providers in the USA um, fund transcranial magnetic stimulation treatment. In the US, TMS is now used in well over a thousand clinics. Um, and of the 12,000 plus clinical papers on TMS, about two and a half thousand papers were written on uh, major depressive disorder. The results are very, very significant. In 2015, NICE, uh, the National Institute of Health and Care Excellence, um, cleared TMS for the uh, treatment of depression with no major safety concerns. Adoption in the UK is now starting to take off significantly. Um, we have some major centers in, um, the, in NHS England, 
um, who have adopted TMS. There is an ongoing trial um, in the NHS in, in England called the BrightMind study, which is ongoing. And I'm delighted to say that we are just about to embark on a major study and um, rollout in Wales so that Wales um, can offer this treatment across um, the whole of the spectrum. So Maxim TMS th therapy is currently used by psychiatry clinics in the UK and worldwide. The adoption is becoming highly significant. It is a major tool in the psychiatrist's armory in the treatment of major depressive disorder. And just, uh, just to round up a little bit um, with some, um, some images, um, on the left, you will see a patient's uh, functional MRI, um, a patient presenting with major depressive disorder. And you can see the left dorsolateral prefrontal areas of the brain um, are very low in activity. And post RTMS treatment, which is a treatment that lasts four to six weeks, um, the, the um, functional MRI on the right shows reactivation of that area. And it, the proposed theories of use is that um, TMS obviously causing um, uh, neurons to um, uh, depolarize and set up pathways throughout the limbic system in the brain. The thought is that it also um, increases neurotransmitter um, production in that area, thence opening up pathways. So a very, very significant um, uh, procedure. So just in summation, very briefly um, from Magstim, we are the pioneers of what is quite a worldwide revolutionary um, therapy. We are innovators. We took it from uh, its raw components way back in the late 80s and now have a very significant uh, clinical tool. We are partners. We partner with clinics, hospitals, psychiatry centers worldwide. And what we are very proud of as well is that we are Welsh. And I'd like to point out here um, that the assistance given and support given by the Welsh government and the Life Science Hub in our pathway over the last uh, 30 years has been highly significant. The Welsh government in 2015 to 16, as we were expanding rapidly here in West Wales, um, were very instrumental in helping us um, expand and build a, a major new facility here and um, also to the Life Science Hub Wales, so been, uh, the help has been invaluable. And the special mention here to Carrie Ann Quinn, who whilst the days in the Welsh government um, assisted us very greatly, and that is ongoing through the Life Science Hub, and also to Dr. Rodri Griffiths um, at the Life Science Hub, who is helping us uh, push forward into providing treatment uh, centers in Wales. So thank you very, very much and look forward to your questions. Thank you, Robin. Very impressive. And uh, it's great to see all this industry and these you know, innovative ideas uh, come into fruition in, in Wales. Uh, and the last speaker um, today is Professor, Professor Jeremy Hall, Director of the Division of uh, Psychiatry and Clinical Neurosciences at Cardiff University. And Jeremy is going to talk to, talk to us about translational neuroscience and the mental health cluster. Over to you, Jeremy. Great. So uh, the exciting bit is obviously getting one screen to share properly. So I'll see if <laughs> I can achieve this. Uh, can you see that? Yes. OK, I can't see you, but I'll uh, I'll carry on and trust that you're there. Thank you very much for the invitation. I've really enjoyed the presentation so far, and there's definitely some new contacts made for me already. Uh, so thanks very much for all of those. Fascinating. Uh, as Julie mentioned, my name's uh, Jeremy Hall. I'm an academic psychiatrist based in the university. I lead our University Innovation Institute in Neuroscience and Mental Health and our Division of Psychiatry and Clinical Neuroscience. And really, you know, as a university, we're very keen uh, to, uh, to develop our regional links further uh, and to help build the environment here in Wales for neuroscience and mental health research and applications. So we, the way we view this is around building a, a cluster 
and the challenge that we see is to reduce the uh, burden of mental ill health. This is both the uh, disorders of childhood, of, of adulthood, and also the considerable mental health burdens, as we've already heard, in old age. And we have a great opportunity here uh, because we have great Cardiff and Welsh scientists to make our region a leader in precision mental health. And we want that to impact not just the universities in this area, but uh, beyond that into the community. So I probably don't need to remind anybody here about the huge costs of mental ill health to the individual, uh, to businesses, and to the economy. And I've put some figures on here, largely uh, specifically for Wales, um, but of course the global impacts and costs of mental ill health are absolutely enormous. Um, so against this, you know, we can truly claim in Wales to have world leading expertise in some of the most critical areas of science, um, both in genetics and in neuroscience related to mental health and dementias. And we've seen uh, very proudly considerably contributed to by Welsh scientists, great advances in these areas over the last decade or two. And this means that uh, with the kind of technologies that we've been hearing about already in this session and building on advances in genetic understanding of conditions like major mood disorders uh, or, or psychosis or dementias, uh, it's a very timely uh, time to develop new treatments. So the opportunity at this moment is for our region to become the go-to region for this kind of work. Um, how can we build up this ecosystem? I think there are a number of elements and I probably will leave some out for the brevity of time, but uh, yeah, we have excellent uh, academic researchers as I've already mentioned uh, in this area, rated very highly uh, nationally and internationally, uh, spanning expertise in the relevant genetics, which is such an important underpinning for understanding these conditions advanced neuroscience techniques, brain imaging, large data, and even academic experts in uh, neuroscience and mental health drug discovery. And we look at this right across the age range, including, of course, the very close work with our UK Dementia Research Institute, head by Julie, and our Wilson Foundation Institute uh, for Young Persons Mental Health. This is, of course, supported by major national and regional funders. We're increasingly seeing the university working with partners to undertake clinical efficacy studies. Uh, so we're moving this out beyond academic excellence. I'll talk a bit more about that in a minute. And then working with a range of regional companies uh, for commercialization. And this I'm sure will be an expanding group as we go forward. And of course, we're extremely keen to see impact in the NHS and through things like regional charities. Uh, patient impact with the range of benefits that that can bring us. I just want to go through three examples, each brief, of the type of interactions that we've been having between the university and uh, industry more broadly. There are many others I could have drawn on, and I think there'll be more developing after these discussions today. But uh, if we think about international investment into the region, um, Takeda, some of you may know, some of you may not know, but it's a global uh, pharmaceutical company, one of the top 10 global pharmaceutical companies. They, one of their three major planks of research is in neuroscience, and they were looking for a new center to take uh, psychiatric drug treatment identification forward. And after looking globally for a center to do this, they've partnered with us in Cardiff University. It's an ongoing partnership. It's already bringing skilled jobs and expertise into our region. And we think there's considerable ex uh, a potential to expand this type of interaction uh, that we are approached quite frequently by other companies interested in this area and can see the potential for a large scale pre-competitive genomics and neuroscience space here in South Wales for companies to come to and develop their research. I mentioned that we have been developing our new trials and uh, early phase clinical interventions. And I wanted to give one example here where we're working with 
the Simbeck Orion Group in Merthyr Tydfil. Uh, they've been an extremely good partner with us, uh, and we've been able to take forward a, a novel compound uh, being studied by our colleagues here in the Medicines Discovery Institute in Cardiff, uh, obtained a very significant uh, external funding uh, for a first-in-man study of this treatment for cognitive difficulties in schizophrenia uh, with the Simbeck Orion Group. And this is an exemplar of looking how the region can be a hub for early neuroscience trials, uh, working with partners like Simbeck. And finally, uh, we have lots of latent potential for spin-out companies in Cardiff uh, in this area. And very sadly, some of these, uh, some fantastic companies that have spun out have already uh, been successfully spun out, but have left the region because they weren't able to be successfully set up in the region. So we need to change this. Uh, an example here is a company that I'm personally involved in, I should declare, which is called Meomics, which is a precision psychiatry company using neural stem cells to screen new treatments and identify precision therapies. Uh, so these are great opportunities. There are many others here in the region, um, but we need to have the right environment to nurture these uh, spin outs and to develop them locally rather than elsewhere. So how do we see this environment developing? I, I mentioned a number of the things on the left here, uh, which are investments that have already taken place in the region. The university has put its money where its mouth is, if you like, in terms of its Innovation Institute in Neuroscience and Mental Health. And we're looking forward to try and get regional investment from, for example, central government and uh, in, through things like the Strength in Places uh, schemes. And, and we want to work with you know, the range of uh, partners that we can locally to make that happen. What might be the kind of key areas to this infrastructure? Well, as I've already alluded to, we have uh, expertise and, and really exciting interactions around uh, drug discovery and target identification, around early clinical trials, and as we heard in some of the earlier talks, uh, and I, I haven't dwelt on so much for that reason, but very exciting opportunities in, in what might generally be called advanced intracranial therapeutics. And what we really need to do is to develop the skills pipeline and also the structural and investment pathway in the region to enable us to fully benefit from these opportunities. And so we at the university, uh, colleagues and myself are very committed to uh, making this happen in South Wales and uh, you know, very keen to uh, open up the dialogue and uh, talk to people who want to work with us on this. So thank you very much for your attention. I shall endeavour to end my show. Uh, there we go. Th well, thank you, everybody. And, um, uh, if anybody's got any questions, please put them in the comments um, section, but I, I certainly have. I, I, got a, I wanted to start with a specific question on the delivery of gene therapies. Now, both Vincent and Rupert mentioned this, uh, you know, this possibility in, in your talks. Would you be able to, to talk to that? Perhaps um, Rupert first and then Vincent. Or maybe Vincent first and then Rupert. No, no, ha ha happy, to, happy to, Julie. I was just uh, unmuting myself. Sorry. All right. <laughs> I have to find the button, first of all. Uh, um, yeah, happy to. Um, yeah, we've developed it. Um, it's suitable for, as I say, for single shot um, of, of whatever it is. So Vincent mentioned the AAVs, and certainly they are a common vector uh, to use for delivering gene therapy. And we are we're able to deliver uh, gene therapies through through the use of those vectors through our catheter system. And the beauty of it, of course, is that it's extremely precise, extremely targeted, gets to exactly where it needs to be. Um, which is often the challenge with delivering therapeutics to the brain. Um, uh, and so, yeah, our, our device can be and is being used, uh, of course, initially in preclinical work to understand the, the toxicity, the distribution dynamics and so forth uh, of, of, of the acute delivery in the particular drug. Um, and then on into clinical trials. I think it's worth commenting at this point though it, it really has to be a partnership between between us as the, the device um, manufacturer and developer and the actual therapy developer because each therapy that's delivered requires a, a bespoke set of conditions to make sure it's delivered optimally 
to the correct region and the distribution once delivered is fully understood. So it's not a system like a syringe you can just buy off the shelf and away you go. It has to be a collaborative and a true partnership to get the best out of both the therapy and the device. Thank you, Rupert. I, I think this is a really fascinating area and, and, and something that you know we have in Wales with, with the you know your technologies and perhaps Vincent can talk about the potential for the future, what what um uh, for, for your work, Vincent, and, and possibly others. Yeah, I mean, so I think uh, I I agree with what's been said, like in that one, it has to be, it takes a village, right, to uh, uh, to get a therapy into, uh, from, from the lab into people. And so and I think we're well placed for this right now because there's on one hand, as Jeremy pointed out, you know, the genetics, uh, the, uh, and then there's the technology development, then, the, you know, the proximity to, uh, to the clinicians as, as well, not to be, you know, it, so it's not just like me coming up with a way to to correct DNA in a cell, but it's also, you know, everybody around to get from that to uh, into the clinic. So I think that there's there's that and there's, this is an advantage in, uh, here for sure. Um, the other thing, of course, is that the devil's in the detail all the time with, uh, with these kinds of delivery systems. And I'm thinking more of the AV type rather than the, the you know uh, what Rupert just talked about, um, and in and so in the next few years, I think there uh, there are two things that people are looking at in in terms of AV based deliveries, and one is uh, safety, um, you know, and then the other is is to try to see if we can put uh, Cas9 in a, in a single AV, which is a, which is limiting at the moment, and and so that those are things that will need to happen. You know, uh, keep in mind as well that it's a it's an iterative process, right? So you start with something that sort of works, and then you improve on it as as the first one goes and th mm -hmm. goes through the, the clinic. And so it's not a it's not a one off type thing. Mm. But what what one of the um, potentials is is that you know if everything goes to plan, you could be looking at a single dose right. cure yes. <laughs> for some some of these rarer uh, disorders, which is amazing so so those yeah, yeah. that that's the sort of end result which is is uh, very exciting i'm, I'm yeah, going to move yeah. now yeah, thank you i'm i'm going to move now to to jeremy and robin and and um i'm going to ask perhaps jeremy first you know where do you see uh, us in 10 years you have a a really exciting and ambitious uh, vision there i mean how you know what, what could wales look like in 10 years time if if this comes up yeah, I, I, I think at the moment there isn't a place you would go to. If you, so if you're wanting to invest or develop your neuroscience country company, there isn't a place in the UK or even in Europe that you would go to. I think Wales can be that place. Uh, we have all the pieces. We have, you know, fantastic academic excellence. Uh, I'm very grateful to Vincent for just mentioning, you know, the good clinical links and our work with the NHS that we have. Fantastic data. Uh, uh, you know, and, and some really great regional companies already in the, in the environment to work with. And uh, so I think we we need to be collectively ambitious about it, uh, uh, but we can stake our claim. And uh, I also think that, you know, um, it's to get the attention of, you know, funding from Westminster and the like, we have to know what we are really good at and enunciate that really clearly. Uh, and I think this is an area... Yeah, I would say that, wouldn't I? But I think this is an area that we can do that in. And uh, mm -hmm. you know, even just as we've begun to think about this more recently, uh, you know, I've met some fantastic people outside the university, but in the region, and, and you know, today more uh, uh, that, that I think we can work work in this kind of enterprise with. So uh, it's exciting times. Robin, you you mentioned um, that you had uh, received uh, you know very useful help from the Welsh government and the environment within Wales. Would would you like to expand on that and and how that might help all of this to work? Yes, I I, I think um, uh, as I, I I gave my uh, plaudits to the Welsh government. I think this came back to a period when I was managing director here. Um, uh, we were really crammed full here of uh, people and needed to expand with um, the emergence of the major clinical markets throughout the world. Um, 
And at the time prior to having a major investment from um, uh, Californian venture capital, um, the Welsh government did step in to um, assist us in facilitating a major expansion here, not only just in the, the bricks and mortar and the equipment to facilitate growth, but also initiatives to uh, attract employment here. So we, in, in, in West Wales, which as you know, is pretty much a, a, an unemployment hotspot, we now employ um, about 110, 120 people. Um, we've ridden the COVID storm um, and, and come out the other side, well, nearly come out the other side. Uh, we're doing well. Um, I think looking longer term, I mean, we invest all our revenues, uh, our profit back into research and development. I mentioned that we are um, cleared by the FDA and NICE and other authorities throughout the world for the treatment of major depressive disorder. But uh, essentially, um, and Jeremy can step in and probably tell me where I'm going right or wrong here. You know, neuromodulation is, uh, you know, you can change the way a, a, a or modulate the way a brain works. Uh, so the treatment of depression is one aspect. There are a lot of neurological disorders and um, behavioral disorders that neuromodulation will benefit from. So there's a lot of uh, longer term work on, on stroke rehabilitation. Um, and there's um, currently a, a project going on in the States on Alzheimer's. We're looking at um, uh, which, um, Parkinson's, although the evidence so far is not great for Parkinson's, so that would be great for Vincent and Rupert to pursue. Um, but we have a lot of, of potential applications, but we don't want to come over as snake oil therapists, you know, or sales guys. So we are taking it step by step. I mean, the, the major depressive disorder um, area is such a huge area to address. I mean, that's where it's getting our major focus. But we do see that uh, worldwide, the expansion in this field is highly significant. 15, 20 years ago, TMS was considered a little bit like a quackery. That is disproven. Um, it is very effective. So that's my plug for that. But we are really looking for long-term growth within Wales. But obviously, we have to be more of an international company um, as well. We have to have facilities in the States. We have facilities, as I mentioned, in Europe and Indonesia. We have just set up um, Germany as a direct operation. And we are looking at China and Japan over the coming years. So, you know, we aim to be worldwide, but our core and our heart is here in Wales. Can, can I just say, you know, is there anything more that we could put in place that would make life easier? I mean, one thing oh, that comes to mind okay. is that you mentioned you had to go to California for venture capital. Could we do more in, in Wales uh, around venture capital? Because, you know, people go so far out of London <laughs> with investments and, and can can we do something to, to bring more venture capitalists to what we're doing. Julia, that's a great, great point. I think what happened was um, when we were steering up and gearing up to get an FDA clearance, which is like a bit of the holy grail on expansion, um, our ex pre-existing shareholders um, really wanted an exit. And they were very fearful of the investment required um, um, to go forward with FDA clearance and the risks involved. Um, I mean, we did it at the end of the day without major um, expenditure, but I thought they, they felt that that was their get out. We went through two procedures, uh, processes b before getting acquired by venture capital, private equity, and they were UK based. Um, one had a Welsh origin, it didn't work. Uh, because it was before we got FDA. And a lot of these investors, you know, they like to back a winning horse as it's crossing the finish line, <laughs> yes. you know. And <clears throat> it was ironic that uh, my time um, was getting very distracted by um, fundraising, etc., which, you know, we became quite successful of, but it does divert your attention significantly. Um, the magic wand actually of getting investment was um, when we the day we got FDA clearance in May 2015, um, I, everyone was steering a march to uh, our doorway, desperate to invest in us. And, and that's how it started. So I think really looking, you know, it'd be great 
Uh, I should have probably ventured into finance Wales, etc., a bit more strongly, but it would be great if there was more um, venture capital, private equity, or other funding mechanisms um, in the Welsh arena. It would be very helpful for a lot of startups. I've heard that Jeremy mentioned in startups. I mean, that's essentially what we were, you know, even five years, it's 10 years ago. So, um, you know, we, we, we've taken it through that hurdle and move forward. Jeremy. Sorry, Jeremy, you were going to ask. Yeah, I, was just, I was just going to support exactly what you said. Right? Very interesting to hear about your journey, by the way. Really interesting. And, and I already said we must definitely catch up. But, um, but um, you know, I mean, there's there are some good examples, without going into too much detail, but other people on the call know a lot about this, you know, that, you know, new spot-outs from the spin out from the university in the area of Huntington's disease, extremely promising work, but that's had to receive funding from London and therefore move out of Wales. And that's a real shame. Uh, and I think there is, Julie, to answer your point, a there, there are some me mechanisms locally, but we could definitely do with more, I think, targeted regional investment for those kind of early phases. Uh, uh, which would then hopefully generate significant inward investment as those uh, startups develop over time. And so I do agree with you, Julie. I think that there is, a, a, I think there are some thoughts with the Cardiff City Region deal and other things about how to do this. But that um, that would be really important, uh, I think, for developing the infrastructure in Wales. Okay. Just for our last point, I, I would like to talk about some of the advantages maybe in Wales and and um, you know access to the NHS and and uh, the fact that the NHS in Wales has a separate uh, means to um, uh, accept or not uh, new technologies. You know, it's 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 its own um, uh, NHS-based grouping to do this. Uh, would anybody like to comment um, on that? And and you know, the access to the NHS is this something that makes a difference to to our future, both in terms of academic, but also in in terms of. Um, um, I think yeah. Robin was going to comment, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Julie, uh, are, you, are you referring to Health Technology Wales as a, a, a vector for moving yeah. in? Yeah, because yeah. we've, we've just been, you know, um, we're in the process at the moment, so I don't want to, uh, I don't want to sort of, you know, uh, jump in to... here. But, um, yeah, so uh, this came about is, like, we are in most healthcare systems in the world, but not Wales at the moment. So it was my frustration and seeing how big the mental health crisis uh, is in Wales um, that uh, uh, facilitated by the Life Science Hub as well that, you know, we pushed Health Technology Wales. We're starting a pilot scheme here in, in West Wales through Howell Da um, Health Board that hopefully will start soon with a aim to moving out and, and getting uh, TMS treatment available throughout the NHS in in. Uh, Wales, um, which would be a, a, a really fantastic thing. Obviously, I'm a bit biased. I come from the company, but you know, I know that my my children know that they've had experiences where their friends have suffered major um, mental health problems. You know, unfortunately, um, suicide was part of that. And 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 you know, I, I have a two pronged feeling here. There's the business side of me saying we've got to move forward, but there's the father, and it's 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 the caring human being. We've really got to move forward. We're a Welsh company, and it'd be yeah. great to be recognised within our own area. But that's a bit political. But I think, you know, that vector into the NHS through Health Technology Wales is is is, is been fantastic for us. It's not there yet, but it's moving forward. I suppose the other aspect is is access to um, to the NHS, uh, and you know, we have Healthwise Wales. You have the Sale database based in Swansea, which is. You know, uh, the best in the UK, I'm told by others outside Wales, but this is access to, you know, through over three million different people that have, have lived or live in Wales. So, so these things, from from a scientist's point of view, allow us um, to to uh, some advantage there, and that's another element that I think um, uh, we do quite well in Wales. We're small enough enough to have that good communication between the NHS and people wanting to contribute to research and research and development in the future. So I just wanted to mention that element. Now, we literally have one minute, I think, or maybe 20 seconds. Anybody would like to make a last point? Um, if not, I, I, I will just pull it together and say, you know, we have world-class research 
uh, global industry and a very supportive environment in Wales. And, and that bodes for great success in the future, hopefully. And, and uh, you know, thank you all for your presentations. I think it's given us a, a glimpse of the future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for watching. Rewatch all of our sessions online. Thank you to our partners.